I'm so excited to welcome you back to another week of Your Brand Amplified. I'm Annika Jackson, and I'm here today with Jeremy Slate. Jeremy, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, stoked to be here hanging out. Awesome. So you're the founder of the Create Your Own Life podcast. You study high performers. You studied literature at Oxford. Um, and now you do a lot with podcasting. You have a book. Um, but I, before we get into all that, I really want you to share your story, your journey, um, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, it's kind of wild because like, mm -hmm. I don't think like, number one, like anything I'm doing now didn't exist when I was in college. You know, I'm in my, <laughs> my, my uh, I hit 35 a couple of weeks ago. So I'm in my mid thirties and uh, <laughs> I didn't expect, thank you. I didn't expect to like be spending my life in, in the podcast world. Um, actually in grad school, I had a really cool professor that I'm actually still friends with. And he had introduced me to the whole like podcast world. So I was like, wow, I didn't know that was a thing. So it's back in like 2008, 2009. And I just kind of became a, a super fan of the format. And like in back in those days, there were a few great shows out there. But at the same time, it was a lot of like audio books that were in the public domain that mm. people would read them and put them out there. And you'd be like, okay, this person's voice is great. This one is terrible. <laughs> um, so like, you know, that was kind of like my introduction to the platform. Um, and I have one podcast uh, that I've listened to literally since 2009 called the No Agenda Show, where they play like news clips and, you know, wacky like morning show sounds and stuff. And it's kind of fun. Um, makes makes the world kind of seem a whole lot less stressful. But um, at the same time, I've I, I got my master's in history. So like that's what I thought I was going to do with my life was be a college professor. Wow. In 2012. Um, I was teaching high school, actually. I didn't get into the PhD program I wanted to get into, though I did have my master's at that point. Um, my mom ended up having a really, really bad stroke. Mm -hmm. And it made me look at a lot of the different things that I was doing in my life. And I'm like, you know, is this really what I want to be doing? And I think for some of us, and at least for me, we realize that we're, we're chasing other people's dreams. Um, and for me, I was chasing the dream that my parents wanted for me. And I'd never really explored, like, what do I want out of life? So I was given a network marketing presentation. I didn't know what that was. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to be a millionaire like next week. Great. <laughs> uh, let's start lining up the jets in front of my house. Um, and, you know, needless to say, it didn't happen, but it was kind of the first thing to get me started. I remember calling the principal and quitting that job. And he's like, you're insane. You're going to quit for that. It's like, yeah, it's better than this. So like I, I went from network marketing to selling life insurance to eventually I went to China, learned how to, you know, source products and I private labeled and sold them on the internet. And none of these things I was really that successful at, frankly. I actually ended up working at a friend's marketing firm. I had taught myself how to build websites, hmm. started a podcast as a hobby. We had 10,000 listens in our first month. And from there, you know, people started asking for help. And, you know, that's where our agency Command Your Brand came from. Nice. Yeah. So tell me more about Command Your Brand. So the first version of what, what we did was called Slate Media Productions, where we did kind of this like podcast in a box thing. Hmm. And I didn't know like how to charge people for things. I had no business experience. I didn't know like what it cost to hire. So at the same oh, yeah. time, like, I did this whole like, you know, we're going to do your social media. We're going to build your website. We're going to edit your show, like, like way too many things. And I'm like, and, it, and I remember telling the first client, it's going to cost you $20,000 a month. And he's like, I'll give you 1200. I'm like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> um, and that kind of like got me started. And we found that a lot of our clients, like we built some really great shows in the health and wellness space. Um, but a lot of our clients were just so busy. They're like, you know, I really don't want to run a podcast. I'd rather just be on shows. And that was one of the things we were doing to, to get people out there. We ended up connecting with another uh, co-founder in Israel. We built a multi six figure business called Get Featured Media in about nine months. But we didn't really see eye to eye. So we, we burned the whole thing down very quickly. And my wife and I then left that company and started Command Your Brand. And since then, we've been helping people to tell a better story to the right people and to actually make an impact. And we're using the power of podcasting in order to do that. I think that's brilliant. Um, you know, I've had this podcast since only 2020, and I didn't really take it very seriously. It was kind of an add on to like, okay, I'll do a podcast on top of my like business that I was running. And sure. I, I was, pod, you know, cause I'd been podcasting for somebody else and I'd done a radio show previously and a lot of other things like that. So mm -hmm. I love the platform and I do think it's really important for people to look at new media. I mean, I'll, I listen yeah. to podcasts when I'm walking the dog, when I'm in the car over the radio, cause I want to learn things and I want to, you know, absorb stuff from other people. Um, and you can't 
like getting an article, you can't read that article while you're driving or you're doing other life things. It's not as easy to digest as podcasts. And so I think well, it's also different. like relationships are a big part of that too. And yeah. I, and I say that from the perspective of, and you'll, you'll get this, like I am a New York Yankees super fan. Um, I listen to three different Yankees podcasts that come out anywhere between three and five times a week. I know way too much about the hosts. I know way too much about the team. Like, but like, that's a relationship building thing, right? Like you kind of get brought into that fandom, um, uh, whether it's, you know, a true crime podcast or whether it's, you know, a political podcast or whether it's a sports-based podcast and that's, you're not getting that in any other medium. Yeah, this is very true. Um, and I'm sorry to cut you off. I just got excited. No, 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 no. <laughs> now I'm about to go out. I'm like, oh, now it's a sports tangent. So yeah, I've, I've lived in so many cities. I grew up a Chief, Kansas City Chiefs fan. Okay. I've, I've lived in Chicago. I've lived in San Francisco. I've lived in LA. I've lived in Houston. And then of course, my um, partner is from Philly. So now we watch Eagles, Sixers. Can't give up the Kansas Jayhawks. Got, you know, got my NCAA team, but <laughs> yeah. It's it's so. kind of weird in my house. So like, you know, like you're from the from the New York, New Jersey area. You're like, you're kind of like supposed to be a Giants fan, but I'm not. I've been a Green Bay Packers fan my whole life. Oh. <laughs> um, which makes no sense to my family since my dad is like a giant super fan. But like the first Super Bowl I ever watched was I think 97, which was the uh uh New England Patriots versus the Packers. And like that kind of brought me in. And my wife, our whole family is from Philadelphia, so they're like hardcore Eagles fans. So it's it's a little weird for, for the children in my house. It depends on who's dressing the girls based on oh. what jersey they're wearing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I have I have clothes for every sports team, the flags for the house, all the things. Um, but that goes back to what you're talking about. You build yeah. these connections, whether it's with a podcast host and a podcast that you love to follow, especially one that's really engaging and you know, whether it, they bring you in and then when they have guests, you already, it's all, they're already pre-qualified. You're already yeah. trying to have that trust and that belief in whoever they're bringing on as a guest. Yeah. And it's interesting too. Cause I like, I think of some of the podcasts I love the most, like, um, like I mentioned the no agenda show, they just mm -hmm. cover a lot of like news stuff, but in a kind of, um, like more lighthearted way with like sound effects and stuff like that. And the hosts, like in the beginning, they won't cover anything like for the first few minutes, like they'll talk about like a terrible flight they took and like, you know, like they'll go through this whole story around it or whatever. And it's like, I feel like you wouldn't get that in any other medium like TV. They'd be like, cut them off, cut them off. They're, they're going to. But in podcasts, like you really, really get to know people because you get so much of a depth of their life and experience as well. So you're obviously also a serial entrepreneur and you fall into a lot of the traps that many of us have when we've started businesses and we're not really thinking about this is the cost, right? This is yeah. actually our cost. So we should be charging X. We're like, no, we just want to get clients in the door. Correct. Um, so have you seen that? I guess I'm trying to build a correlation between that and the work that you do now and you're helping um, business owners and brands get on podcasts and have mm -hmm. a positive effect on their business. And you've been able to show them, this is a great way to build your reputation, to have that subject matter expertise, to have the instant trust because of the podcasts that you're putting them on, mm -hmm. you know, and therefore hopefully not fall into some of the pitfalls um, that the rest of us do. Yeah, um, I, I, I guess I don't get the, know what the question was. Oh. <laughs> well, I get <laughs> like I get what you're saying, but I don't know where you wanted me to go with that. <laughs> yeah, well, I just like sometimes you know I like to have really organic. Because you mentioned costs, um, you meant you had mentioned costs and like what we charge, um, but like I guess how how does that connect to like where you're going with the branding stuff. I'm sorry, I'm confused. <laughs> oh no, it's okay, yeah. So thinking about when you're running a business and you're thinking about yeah. how you're getting out there and how you're branding and what you're spending money on, I guess that's mm -hmm. where it's gonna go. Oh, right? Okay, yeah, that makes sense now. So now I get I get what you're making at. So like, it's it's kind of interesting because I think people get, and, and I, I apologize, I didn't mean any like- No, uh, no, any, not any at all. <laughs> insult by that. I was just kind of like confused. Um, like, well, there, there's a couple different things, right? Like, you know, like, and, and, and I'll give you like the business owner perspective and also like what we tell people. Cause it's like- yeah. At the same time, when I'm looking at charging for something, you know, I need to charge double minimum what my hard cost is, right? Because you have to be thinking of like, you know, if this takes more than what I than than what I tell somebody it's going to take, like I have to have that cost built in, right? I can't just eat the money. And at the same time, you know, inflation now, like in the last two years, just to keep up, we've had to pay people 20% more than what we paid them two years ago. So it's, those are things you have to consider with your hard costs. And, you know, we've had to do price reevaluations and things like that. And when people look at PR, they try to put 
these kind of weird constraints on it. Like, okay, well, what is my ROI on PR? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times when people are looking at that, they try to make it look like marketing and they try to make it look like other things. But the thing you have to understand is sometimes it's really hard to categorize what your value is from PR, right? Because, you know, what's the value of you being seen as a celebrity in your space? Well, you, it may cost you less to run an ad. Um, it may cost you less to convert a person, but you can't necessarily quantify that, right? Yeah. And at the same time, if people know you like you and trust you, it's easier to make that decision. So I, I find when you're talking about PR, people try to quantify the ROI of it. And that can just be so difficult because frankly, the, the way I like to talk about the conversation is, you know, what's the negative ROI of not doing it, right? Because if somebody doesn't know you like you and trust you, everything takes more money, everything takes more effort. Um, and, you know, you're not creating trust and trust is one of the biggest barriers people make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that I come across often as well, because I do marketing and PR. And I think they used to be like completely separate. And now the lines have kind of blurred. So when you get digital marketing has really made that a problem for us, by the way, it has, it has, but I mean, but then what I'll tell somebody when I'm speaking to somebody who wants, you know, talking about working with somebody is that piece of content that we get from PR, you share it across yeah. all of, you know, but like your website, your blog, your social media, it creates posts, it creates SEO. So it does achieve a lot of marketing goals, but it is not in itself marketing. And there's also a misconception to pe for people on like how you get it, right? Like, um, and I think part of it is like, you know, education problem. And I think the other part of it is, is some, is, is there are some people out there doing things that aren't quite ethical, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're like, okay, well, what does it cost to get that, that Forbes placement? Or what does it cost to get that blog placement? It's like, well, if somebody's telling you they can get you that and it costs you a certain dollar amount, number one, they're lying or the person they're buying it from is going to get themselves in trouble as a contributor pretty darn soon. But the other part about it is, is understanding that like actually getting media coverage, it's stairs and not an elevator, right? You got to kind of build some basic you know, local understandings and basic niche understanding. And the more of those things you get, the more like national pieces you get, the more regional pieces you get, and you can start to get some bigger stuff. But I think one of the biggest things we run into, especially in PR is like this giant education problem. And it comes from both sides. Like, you know, frankly, a lot of PR firms like myself, we do a bad job educating people and you do a better job educating people. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, people come in, you know, thinking they can just buy a media placement. It doesn't work like that. Well, and like you said, there are agencies out there who, who say that they're getting earned media, but they're really getting advertorials and yeah, you know, it's, they're completely different, but people, you've, and I've been in that situation where I've tried to educate a potential client on the mm -hmm. difference. And they're like, Oh no, I paid them X amount and they've gotten me this. And I'm like, that's not even a real publication. I love them. I don't say that to them exactly. Right, in that right. way, but I'm like, these are the things we say privately. I yeah. get it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, but that's not like, you're thinking that's a big New York publication. It's it doesn't really exist. Like, I mean, it exists online for people who buy articles in it and that's it. Yeah. So it's interesting too, because like, we'll get people that'll come to us and they'll say, okay, so what podcast do you have? And it's like, well, we have access to 3 million, but it depends yeah. on which one you're a fit for as well. Right. Because you can't exactly. push a, a square peg into a round hole. And I think like, like there's definitely a big education problem, not only just in the PR world, but also in the marketing world, because people need to understand the difference, you know? Yeah. Well, and going back to podcasts, you saw really, you know, pretty quick success out of the gate with podcasting. Um, but do you find when you're talking to clients that the size doesn't always matter? So if it's the right niche for them, right, then they should be in front of a, the, their ideal audience, even if it's a thousand, five thousand downloads per episode instead of hundreds of thousands. Well, here, here's the thing I'll say is, is number one. So I started in 2014. Mm -hmm. There were like 240,000 podcasts out there. Oh. There's like, <laughs> depends on what directory you looked at now, but there's somewhere between three and three and a half million out there. Like it's yeah. like growing every day. So number one, like just, it was easier to get reached then, frankly, it was. Um, and also at the same time, like I took a stupid amount of action up front, realizing like people just don't find you in Apple podcasts or iTunes or whatever. So like, you know, texting, emailing, annoying people, whatever I could do to like get them to, to subscribe to the podcast. So like I did take, way too much action up front so that, you know, smaller space and more action accounts for like the traffic. The thing I would say is we are in kind of a world now where it's qual uh, quality over quantity, mm -hmm. you know, producing good long form content that really leaves somebody with something. There's a lot to be said for that. And there's a lot more value in, you know, the right hundred or thousand or whatever people than the tens of thousands. 
And I think, or the, or the tens of millions, whatever it may be, I think sometimes people get so stuck on the numbers rather than, is this the right person that needs to hear my message? Because here's the thing, you know, the host you're sitting with could just be a great connection for you. You guys could do business together. There could be a speaking opportunity. There could be a, like, I've made friends with so many people that I've done podcasts with. So like, that's just part of it too. Like to only be thinking about big numbers and audience is so short-sighted. Like there's incredible people you're getting with. And at the same time, if you're creating trust with a very niche group, that's what's going to help your business grow. So the, you'll get this when I when I say it. Like the, the question we have to we ask people a lot of times when they tell us the same five podcasts they all want to be on mm-hmm. is I say, is this to grow your business or is this because you want to feel better about yourself? I'd like I, I just got to be honest sometimes. Like, is yeah. it vanity or is this because you want to grow your business? Yeah, no, that's a very, very good point and question. Um, so when on your own podcast, you study high performers. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? So it's interesting because I think my viewpoint on what high performance is, is has changed over the years. Like I think some in the beginning it was about like making the most money or doing the most whatever. But at the same time, it's like, you know, how rich is your life? Um, how much value is there in your relationships and things like that? So there's a, a lot of different things I've learned off of that. And that actually led to the, uh, the book I wrote that came out on the 21st called Unremarkable to Extraordinary is you know, adversity and how people react to it. We all have it on different levels and it's a sliding scale, right? Like what may be adversity for me is an adversity for you and vice versa. So it's a sliding scale. And it's one of the things that I can't judge what's hard for you and you can't judge what's hard for me. So because of that, like those things can change people in different ways, but you can approach it um, in a certain way, right? Like approaching adversity saying, okay, this situation may suck, but if I come out of it a better, stronger, and more experienced person, it's a really, really valuable thing. And what is my advantage from this? So it's a lot of stuff like that. Like, you know, like, what does it mean to build a legacy? Well, it doesn't just mean to the amount of money you leave behind. It ma- matters the change you create, the people you help to grow. Mm-hmm. So there, there's so much depth in that and what it means to be somebody that's high, a high performer or, or extraordinary. It, it, it actually comes down to, to so many different aspects that people just don't consider a lot of times. Yeah, I love that. And I feel like it's, you know, I'm a different generation than you. I'm an ex. <laughs> um, and, and I do feel that millennials are so much better at finding that balance and really thinking, expanding the lens of what it means to be successful or high performer or have an impact in the world and um, a better, you know, there's never any like balance is kind of a word that isn't really true. There's everything, you know, you're on the teeter totter. But, yeah, but it's it's interesting, now. though, too, because like I feel like I don't always quite fit in my generation because I think my generation as well, like like it's good to like, you know, be working on purpose and things like that. But I think they run into this trap of finding your passion versus, you know, like following your passion mm. and following your passion. Like that's a kind of a passive thing, right? Like it's you, you see it, it's up there, you know, keep walking, maybe you'll get to it. Finding your passion, like it takes work. It takes doing a lot of things you don't like to do. It takes experiences. It takes a lot of those things. Finding your passion is an active experience. And I do think, frankly, that's something that the, you know, my generation, millennial generation falls into is they've kind of fallen into this, this inaction or kind of, you know, okay with, with how things are right now, because, you know, like one day they'll find their passion. Well, finding your passion implies implies you're doing something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's also that thing of like, this might be your passion, but what are your, what's your skill set? You know, Bingo. We, we all want to find that balance of like, we want to do something that we really love with our jobs. Easier said than done a lot of times. That's, and that is the, the single <laughs> truest thing that, that, that has happened on this podcast, right? That, that, that is it right there. So, so brilliant point. Um, because at the same time, like there's my favorite book I like to recommend to people. It's called So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. Hmm. And Cal talks about um, the, the title comes from uh, the comedian, Steve Martin, his autobiography, where they asked him, well, Steve, how did you get to be like such a recognized comedian? He's like, well, I was just so good. People couldn't ignore me. <laughs> and it comes down to like finding something you're good at, right? Like you don't have to be passionate about it up front and you just can continue to get better and better and better at that thing. And if that thing can make you money and that thing can get you attention, you're going to find you get pretty passionate. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you have to take a look at is sometimes find looking for your passion to be there before what you do is kind of putting the cart before the horse. Yeah, that's very, very true. Um, now your book, it just came out. Yeah. And is it based on your interviews on your podcast um, as yeah. well as other people and your own story as well? So it's there, there's one story that is in the book that it's not somebody I've had a conversation with, but I've read seven books on. Um, wow. And that is, okay. that is uh, 
Tom Brady, who I think is one of the, the greatest professional athletes ever to play a sport. Um, not because I was ever a Patriots fan or a Bucks fan, you know, lifelong Packers fan. But I think the thing that's really remarkable about him is you look at him and he barely started his senior year of high school, barely started in college and actually had to compete for the starter role, drafted in the sixth round and only played because uh, Drew Bledsoe like literally almost died in the field. Mm. So w- what I think is interesting about that is he didn't have everything given to him. He didn't have the greatest skill set. He wasn't the number one draft pick, and that made him have to work. And I think there's so much value in that. So that's the only conversation that's in the book that is not one that I had, but I've learned a lot about. But all the other ones are based on the, we're actually going to hit 1,000 this week, but um, you know, 999 conversations that I've had uh, leading up to this point. And, and it's interesting because I found like eight things in common with all of them, like how they approach adversity, um, you know, how they approach their dreams, how they approach leadership. Like I, I learned a mind blowing thing from uh, former CIA director, uh, David Petraeus um, around like how you lead people, like, like something that I thought was so interesting is he learned how to lead people individually and because of that lead a great group, right? Because like what motivates me may not motivate somebody else and what motivates somebody else may not motivate me. And he's learned how to like come to people where they're at. And because of that really lead them. It's like some of the things I learned are just really, really incredible. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. And I did not know that about Tom Brady because everybody just thinks of him as like, you know, this golden boy who, who's always had a silver spoon in his mouth. And I don't think especially if you're not like an avid sports fan, you're not, you don't yeah. know the backstory. Yeah. He was drafted by the Montreal Expos to play catcher. Oh my um, God. And he didn't think he was good <laughs> enough to play major league baseball. So he kept trying at the, at the whole, um, at, at the whole football thing. And um, his senior year at, at university of Michigan, Lloyd Carr was the head coach. And um, there were two starting quarterbacks, him and a guy named Drew Henson. That was a first round pick of the New York Yankees. And it was this whole weird thing of, okay, we're going to play Brady for half the game. Okay. Now we're going to play Henson for half the game. And he had to always have to like, try to get better because he wanted to start. And by, you know, by halfway through that, that year, he became the starter and he actually led them um, to a bowl game championship and things like that. But like, I think to me, there's so much value in somebody having to work their butt off. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now what continues to inspire and motivate you? My kids, frankly, Um, I have a a one and a half year old daughter, uh, Emerson, and a three and a half year old daughter, Adelaide, and um, they're wild and I love it. Like, you know, they they ask so many questions. They will try anything. Um, You know, Addie was talking at nine months and sprinting at, at eight and a half. And, you know, Emmy was like walking under a year like they've they just will try anything. They're fearless. But at the same time, like, you know, their daddy, I love you. And they like, they really care. Like, so to me, that inspires and motivates me is like, you know, at least the future I'm helping to bring with it, with the kids who are raising. Amazing. I love that. We were talking before we started about, you know, I have a child on the other end of the spectrum. My daughter's about to go into high school, but it's, it goes by. I was told I should be worried about that. Um, I don't think so. I think especially it sounds like you have girls who know who they are already. Oh, they do. And you're going, you, you and your wife are raising them that way to be really self-confident. And that's the best is when you have other moms say, oh yeah, my kid said that your child does her own thing. If she doesn't want to go along with the crowd, you know, she's happy to go do something else and play something else on the playground or read a book or whatever it is. And um, I think that's the best thing is when you see like, We can only do a little bit to shape because I think they already are who they are, but it's it's a really beautiful experience. I I think as parents, like our job is to kind of notice what the natural inclinations are and kind of help them to explore that a little more. Does that make sense? Like, you know what I mean? Like um, my three-year-old, like, you know, she's been, she's been doing dance for a year and a half. Um, My wife started it too, because she just loved to dance. And it's like, she loves dance. Like, it's not something we like forced her to do. Like she asked us to help her do it. So I think (laughs) like, I think our job is just to kind of help them develop the talents that they enjoy and are naturally showing. Yeah. And I think it helps when they can see their parents enjoying what they do for work and in life. Right. That's so important too, because like, I think so many parents, like, you know, like we're so busy, like, you know what I mean? Like, I think we we're so busy. Like, I think sometimes we don't kind of stop and, you know, smell the roses and say, Oh my gosh, you're doing such a great job. You are such a great artist. Like I love and appreciate what you're doing. Um, 
And so I think that's one part of it is just reminding ourselves that because life is hard, right? Like we're doing a lot of stuff. It's, we don't always remember to like stop and do that stuff. So I think as parents, it's also encouraging from that perspective. Absolutely. And um, I know your book is probably not on bedtime reading yet, but hopefully soon that when they, so that they can get all the inspiration from everybody that you've talked to and learn from as well. But so what you just released your book. Yeah. What do you plan to do with it? Are you going on a book tour? I mean, I know with COVID still kind of around, some stuff is back in person, some stuff is virtual. Um, yeah, so th that's the first question is what's that? And then what's next for your brand? So we've just focused a lot on doing podcasts. I do have some keynotes around it. So like I just got back from Mexico uh, recently, uh, Playa del Carmen, which is a lot of fun. Uh, we have some more stuff coming up in a couple of weeks, but for me, it's been a lot on podcasts. Um, Cause I'm just not a huge, like traditional media watcher as it is, but like I've done, um, we booked a hundred podcasts. I've been, I think 47 so far. Um, and I've just had some incredible conversations just, which has been just really great. And I've really enjoyed it. And I've made a lot of great friends. So frankly, that's just been what we've been doing is, is focusing on just really great podcasts. We had a launch party, um, last week, which is awesome. We had about 40 people here, um, sold a bunch of books that way. Nice. We're also mailing a couple thousand books out to people that pre-ordered and to also um, like people featured in the book and stuff like that. So really it's been that um, it's been around, um, you know, getting on a bunch of podcasts. We're also doing a ton uh, with YouTube ads too, around stuff with the book as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. I can see you moving from podcast to having like a conference with all of the amazing people who are in your book and everybody come in person and get to hear them and then get their book signed and, and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> just, just putting it out there to you. If you had not been that way, maybe, I... <laughs> maybe at some point, I know like it's, it's starting to get a little bit better with like doing conference stuff, but I think we're just not a hundred percent there yet. Like depending, I guess what state you're in, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. So if somebody wanted to learn more about working with you, what's, do you have like some things on your website that they can look through or what's the first step? So if they want to work with us, I put together a really great uh, piece for them called the seven reasons you're not getting featured in your favorite podcast. And it goes over a lot of the basic PR actions you need to know to like really start building your brand. So if they go to crush it on um, and you know, podcast with an S or podcast without an S will both work. So crush it with uh, They can grab that. If they're interested in the book, they can head over to get And if they come back with their order number, We'll give them a free version of the audio book, as well as our um, audio guide called 30 Days of Extraordinary. Oh, very cool. I'm going to be signing up for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one of my favorite things about talking to people is I learned so much about um, tools and resources that I didn't know. And, you know, you, you can be in the field, but if you're not using that for your own, you know, it's like the cobbler without the shoes. Like I, all, I love all the I, books I get, like people like mail books to me. And I'm like, how did you get my own address? This is so oh creepy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That is hilarious. Yeah. No, I've gotten some from uh, people who've been on my podcast and I, I love it. I'm like, okay, now I have like all these things, all these resources. I'm building up my own resource library, um, just from my own podcast and from interviewing great people. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if this is a question that you'll be prepared for or not, but I like to ask uh -oh. you what your favorite quote is, or if you have a mantra or something else. So you live by. I feel like it's also like quotes you live by in that season. You know what I mean? Like in that, like they're the one I've been using a lot recently. Um, I'm a huge Mark Twain fan. Um, I read a lot of like I, I have books and books and books of like Mark Twain anthologies, and there's a quote from him where he says you know, most men die at 27, but they're not put in the ground till 72. Ooh. Because you know what I mean? We quit on our dreams in our 20s. And you know, eventually we die, but we really die in spirit pretty early. Yeah. Wow, that's a that's a very motivational, <laughs> a little dark, but very motivational. But it's true, right? Because like, at yeah. some point in time, you're like, all right, I'm an adult now, I got to put those things away. I got kids to worry about, I got bills to pay, I got taxes to handle. Yeah. And I think part of it is figuring out like, how do you keep that part of you alive, right? Because that part of you is there, you need to feed it and you need to figure out how you nurture it at the same time. But I think we get to a certain point um, where we stop really like acknowledging who we are and taking care of ourselves as a person. And you kind of die a little bit when that happens. Definitely. I know that's something I've been working on this year is making sure I'm being intentional 
-hmm. and that I'm also more present and being versus just doing and being and the busyness of life all the time, but trying it gets to be mechanical, really like when you get yeah. into it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that is what sucks our souls completely. Yeah. So what else would you like to share that we haven't covered? And I'll, I'm going to list all of your, you know, your, the book links and everything. Yeah. In the notes. I would say like, if there's one thing I would recommend people do, I would recommend that they don't worry so much about, you know, following their passion. I would recommend like, you know, you find what you're good at. You continue to work on that. You continue to expand on that. And, you know, worry about the life you're creating for yourself, not about life happening to you. I think so many people, you know, this has kind of been a theme what we've been talking about in the last few minutes, but it's like so many people kind of talk about what life has done to them and where they're at in their point. And it's like, you know, life's not a spectator sport. There's going to be some good things that happen to you. There's going to be some bad things that happen to you, but it's kind of like jujitsu, right? Like you figure out how to use your opponent's energy against them. And you kind of use that motion, good or bad to, to kind of be more active and more proactive in your life. And I, and I think, you know, I've had some really crappy stuff happen to me. A lot of us had, but it's, how are you going to use that motion to, to kind of further what you want to do with your life? And those are very wise words to end on today. Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on the show and to our audience. I think that you, like me, hopefully got some great information from Jeremy, command your brand, some great tidbits. And um, of course I'll put them all in the show notes, as I said. So thank you for coming back for another week of your brand amplified and Jeremy, thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, Annika, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.